Welcome. It's lunchtime, which means it's time for the hobby hour. Today, we're going to discuss the recent Texas election and also the prospects for the upcoming midterms and also assessing President Biden's first year in office. Our guests and talk about their bios. I also want to remind all the members of the audience to please use the Q&A feature to share any questions you have for the speakers. I'll do my best to get those questions in in an appropriate time. Now, with us are what I want to call the repeat offenders. They're here every <laughs> semester to talk about various issues in public policy and elections. Dick Murray is, has served as professor of political science at the University of Houston for more than 50 years, co-founded the Center for Public Policy, which is now the Hobby School, and its survey operations in 1981. is known as a pioneer in the art of art and science of polling and elections. He provides political analysis for local national media for decades. Dr. Mercy, Dr. Mercy, Dr. Murray is currently a senior research fellow with the Hobby School. Sorry about that mess up on your name, Dick. I should know it by now. Dr. Michael Adams is a political scientist who specializes in electoral politics, redistricting, and voting rights. He is a former interim dean and chair of the political science department at Texas Southern University and currently holds the position of founding director of the executive MPA program at the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leon School of Public Affairs. As a former dean of the School of Public Affairs and chair of the political science department, Dr. Adams has pressed forward with a student-centric approach to the entire operation within the department. Dr. Mark Jones is, the, is a fellow in the political science department at ba Baker Institute. He's a fellow in the political science and at the da Baker Institute. He is a Joseph D. Jamel chair in Latin American studies and a professor as well. Mark's home is Rice University. He also serves as faculty director of Rice's Master of Global Affairs and is a senior research fellow at the Hobby School. His research focuses on the effect of electoral laws and other political institutions on governance, representation, and voting. Renee Cross is a senior director of the Hobby School of Public Affairs. She worked with the district as a district director in the office of State Representative Garnet Cohn before joining Center for Public Policy as a researcher more than 20 years ago. Her focus, her research focuses on Houston and Texas politics and government. She's also the high priestess of all our intern programs and community engagement activities. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start. What do you think the biggest takeaways are from the elections the other day? We'll start with you, Mark. Okay, well, I guess uh, um, one takeaway is within the Republican Party, it remains a very conservative party at the statewide level. Um, most of the candidates running adopted a very conservative position on most of the issues to the extent to which you had somebody sort of bucking that trend, uh, say Betsy Price running in Tarrant County to try to be the Tarrant County judge, she lost. Uh, at the statewide level, Governor Abbott did very well, uh, winning about two thirds of the vote in, in spite of having two relatively credible opponents who spent over $20 million. And I think he really cemented himself as the sort of undisputed leader of the Texas Republican Party, or at least the principal leader of the party. Uh, at the Attorney General's race, that was, I think, probably the most interesting one on election night where Ken Paxton didn't get to 50% like he wanted but did get his preferred uh, runoff uh, option, that is, uh, better, uh, that is uh, George P. Bush, who he should be able to defeat in the May runoff. I'll, I'll stop there and leave it to others to talk about other aspects of the election. But I think you know, for all intents and purposes, it was a pretty normal election in the sense that turnout was low. It, it did, was a record as a share of the voting age population for Republicans, although that's just 9%. Democratic turnout, there was just much less going on on the Democratic side. And it was more its standard 5% of voting age population. Michael, what were some of the takeaways you took from the election? Yeah, first, I, I think what I call the Trumpification of Texas politics. And uh, looking at the plural executive, certainly I was, there were no surprises in terms of Abbott's performance and either uh, O'Rourke. Um, however, um, in terms of the attorney general's race, it seems as though uh, ethical concerns uh, and also we could say for the agriculture commissioner's race, uh, the voters uh, didn't seem to be deterred on the Republican side uh, in terms of the numbers we saw, although Paxton uh, is in a runoff now with George P. And so that was something that I think we have to watch. Uh, in terms of uh, on the Democratic side, I think three races we can look at is Congressional District 28 and also Congressional District 35. 
and Congressional District 30 in terms of you have uh, an opportunity where progressives could be elected in those positions. And so what does that pretend to the party where we've seen a lot of food fights in Congress and where the president has suffered in terms of trying to get his bill back better legislation passed? And I'll stop there. Right. Renee, what were your takeaways? Well, certainly incumbents ruled uh, for, for the most part. Um, as Mark mentioned, the AG race for the Republican nomination was uh, the exception to that rule. Uh, the most exciting part really was to see who actually would pull out in second place. Um, a lot of the polls had, had suggested that more than likely it would be George P. Bush. However, uh, Ava Guzman gave a really good showing right at the end. And I think for those of us that are maybe Houston or Harris County centric, uh, if you look at the Harris County portion of uh, George P. Bush's um, victory to second, wasn't very impressive. So I don't know if he has any um, mis uh, regrets, I guess, about perhaps not giving Harris County uh, the money that most of us think we were due in terms of the Harvey relief funds. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if that's mentioned in the next couple of months, particularly when he's out uh, politicking in our area. Um, another interesting uh, race to me was the one for agriculture commissioner uh, on the Republican side. Sid Miller easily won uh, close to, I believe, 59%. Uh, however, he too, like Paxton, has been, um, I guess, tainted somewhat by scandals uh, during the time that he's been in office. And interestingly enough, even though he is a darling of the very far right, um, he doesn't necessarily have a very good relationship with Governor Abbott or Lieutenant Governor uh, Patrick. So that one was interesting to watch because of those variables. Plus he had two credible candidates, one in particular, James White, uh, who was a former student of Dr. Murray's and a, a, a well-respected state representative. So um, he obviously has some very strong loyalists within the Republican party. Um, Others that we were keeping a close eye on was Congressional uh, District 8 on the Republican side, uh, but which came down uh, to Morgan Luttrell, who was favored by President Trump winning, but that wasn't necessarily a done deal. Um, Congressional 38, which is our new district out towards Katy out in the West, was easily won by Wesley Hunt, which I think is what most folks thought of. And you know, I spoke of incumbents. Um, we had several former uh, public officials run for office, either for their same seat, like we saw in uh, Texas House District 150, where um, Debbie Riddle, who had held that seat for a number of years, challenged the incumbent Valerie Swanson, wasn't even close. Uh, Swanson came out with almost 70% of the vote. Um, another, some other familiar names were in House uh, District 133 that has been held by Jim Murphy for a number of years. And we had um, a very recent city council member, Greg Travis run, as well as going back quite a few years, uh, a Burt Keller run, neither one of them made uh, the runoff. So just because you've been successful running for office uh, before, even recently, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to garner the majority of support. Um, I guess at that point, I probably should be quiet and let uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Murray, <laughs> Dr. Murray talk. But if we have time, we can talk about some more of the Democratic races, too. Dick, what's your take? Well, first, keep in mind the turnout, as Mark indicated, it was low, as is usual, a little higher on the Republican side. They, they had tens of millions of dollars spent advertising their candidates, but still we had about three million votes. We should expect more than nine million votes in the November election 
uh, eight months from now. So the primary voting doesn't tell you very much about uh, Texas politics. Most of the voters were repeaters. They previously voted in Democratic or Republican primaries. Uh, and the general electorate will be much, much larger and significantly younger uh, and less of a history of being a strongly partisan. Uh, the races that haven't been mentioned that I was particularly interested in, uh, here in Harris County, we had uh, County Judge Lena Dalgo uh, seeking a, a second term. She had a half dozen Democratic opponents, including one that had some credentials, an African-American lady, uh, Ms. Davis. Uh, but Hidalgo won with 70% of the vote. Uh, and that'll be a great test race. The Republicans have filed a full slate of candidates in Harris County in 2022. They left many positions unopposed in 2020. And I think this is kind of a last ditch effort to regain ground in the state's most populous county. And I think in a, a year that may turn out to be pretty good for Republicans, they, they've got a shot. Probably long term, pretty dismal prospects. But 2022, Harris County Republicans may regain some of the ground they lost in 2018 and 2020. Uh, of course, they don't have their nominee yet for county judge. That goes to one of the this May 24th runoff. Uh, and again, uh, you've got uh, a newcomer that is the lead, leading vote getter and an old comer, former regent of the University of Houston, uh, Mr. Uh, Vidal uh, Martinez. Uh, so we don't know how that will turn out. It, but uh, locally, we, did, we settled most of our races because the maps that were drawn by the legislature and uh, left very, very few competitive districts in November. So despite the fact that most of us chose not to vote, most of us now have our basically de designated representatives and Congress members. Uh, but uh, just one final point, as someone who's worked for many years in redistricting, I followed this latest cycle in 2021, now 2022, and it was different. Uh, Republicans had a lot of incumbents to protect. And generally that was the number one driving force in the congressional redistricting and in the state house and state Senate. And I think the Republican maps were very astutely drawn and will perform well in the general election this year. But there's a fundamental difference in the Senate and the House maps because of the rules. In the House, you have to respect county boundaries, which is a significant constraint on aggressive redistricting. In Harris County, all 24 districts had to be contained within Harris County. This severely limits your ability to use one of the famous tools of gerrymandering, and that is to uh, fracture the vote uh, and reach way, way out into urban, uh, rural areas like Senator Joan Huffman's new state Senate district, which went from being extraordinarily competitive to very safely Republican. But you can't do that with these urban House seats. And so the map was redrawn to protect the nine Republican members as much as possible here. But over a decade probably won't work very well. So I think we'll see the likelihood in the 2020s that the gap between the Senate and the House in Austin will get steadily wider as the Senate is locked in extremely conservative coming out of this round of elections. And that probably won't change because these maps were very skewfully drawn, but the House is probably going to become more uh, moderate uh, with the speaker increasingly relying on democratic votes to hold his position. Uh, and he did okay in, within the Republican primary where the targeted more moderate Republicans generally held off conservative challengers. So the fighting in Austin is going to be a lot between the Senate and the House, which uh, I think we saw some of in 2021, probably gonna happen even more in 2023. And by 2025, you could well have a split with Republicans controlling the Senate for sure, but Democrats possibly regaining the House in a presidential election year. This is a question for all of you. President Trump endorsed several candidates. Can you tell us how successful those endorsements were? I mean, obviously an endorsement is not a guarantee, but the correlation, was it high or was it low or was it in between? I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take a first stab at it. Uh, 
Well, I think you have to sort of di differentiate among the people he endorsed. In some cases, he endorsed people that were unopposed or that had a lock on their election in their primary. So while they won, that's not a very good signal. I think where his endorsements played a very pivotal role were in endorsing people who might otherwise have been challenged from the right uh, as being insufficiently conservative, or at least not uh, not passing the litmus test. That having that Trump endorsement really protected them. It was uh, you know sort of like a Teflon that resisted attack. So we saw that, for instance, in two congressional well, in the congressional race of Wesley Hunt, for instance, having the Trump endorsement really limited the ability of Mark Ramsey and the Freedom Caucus and the three slates to portray Hunt as insufficiently conservative because he had he had Trump's backing. Uh, it also, I think, um, helped uh, Pete Flores, uh, while he didn't get into, while he didn't avoid a runoff in the, his Senate race against Raul Reyes, it did provide him with a pretty uh, a strong advantage. Uh, Greg Abbott having Trump's endorsement really took the wind out of the sails of both Don Huffines and Alan West. And I think it was pivotal for Ken Paxton to have Trump's endorsement. We may have had a very different election if, say, Louis Gohmert had had the uh, endorsement of Trump or George P. Bush, that that was sort of a, a place where it mattered. And uh, you know, Ryan, giving that endorsement to Ryan Guillen down in the valley, while politically not making, you know, seeming a little off since what, you know, Guillen had just switched from the Democratic Party. And while he was the most conservative Democrat, odds are in the House he'll be one of the more centrist Republicans next cycle. That really shielded him from a challenge on the right, which came pretty close, given that the entire Republican Party was lined up behind Guillen. I believe it was Mike Monreal. I don't, uh, the, his opponent still held him to under 60%. They were, so that Trump endorsement there is pivotal. And I think for Tim O'Hare up in Tarrant County, that really helped in terms of going after uh, Betsy Price and sort of signaled that this is the Trump candidate and, and Trump, Betsy Price was not. <clears throat> I think we'll learn a lot more about Trump's influence on May 24th, yes. because there you got a one-on-one -on -one race, and one of the guys is Bush. Admittedly, one of the, the only Bush that I'm aware of that that uh, did support Trump uh, in 2016. Uh, but uh, Trump doesn't like Bush as much, mm -hmm. so I think he'll get much more engaged in the uh, race 10 weeks from now. Mm -hmm. And because it's sort of a standalone contest, and uh, we're still that's still pretty early in the national primary season. We'll get a lot of national press following the the runoff between the incumbent uh, Ken Paxson and, and George P. Bush. And Trump, I don't think, can stay away from that. He will be the moth drawn to that flame. Uh, I mean, personally, when you look at the numbers, I kind of like where Paxson's at, because if you add the 17% that uh, Louis Gorbert got uh, to Paxson's 43, that's 60%. You add Guzman and George P. Bush, that's 40%. Uh, admittedly, turnout drops dramatically in runoffs. Uh, we won't have 1.8 million people coming back out. But Paxson, unless there's some additional uh, legal explosion, it enters this uh, two and a half month runoff season in a stronger position based on the vote we saw earlier this week. Right. I think I, I, that's a good point. Even, and I think even if there's an FBI investigation and there's like their charges filed, I would think that Paxton might be able to use that more to his advantage. Just simply saying that this is just an effort by the Democrats in Washington and the Biden administration to get rid of me, which while that's not a good argument for November, uh, it would be a pretty impressive argument or be a, probably a pretty effective argument for the Republican electorate in, in May, just to use because it, it, that meant that message seems to have worked on all those other charges. <laughs> so, uh, and if you have Biden going after him, you can just simply say, This is they're going after me because I'm the only one fighting for your conservative values. Yeah, Mike, and, like I, 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 no, no, I'm I would like to add the fact that I, I think with the national uh influence and in looking into this election, we saw outsiders come in like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, and Dan Crenshaw was taking hits, but I think the the more and Dan, of course, accepted the outcome of the presidential election, and we saw his candidates, uh, Luttrell. I think he prevailed, and that's interesting that we didn't see these kind of extremists uh, that you can identify as as Trumpists, if you will, have an impact. Relate, related to the Ken Paxton. Uh, George P. Bush race, of course, on the other side of the aisle, we still have to determine the Democratic nominee. And Rochelle Garza, 
relatively came out of nowhere uh, to jump into this race rather late in the period. And we had, again, very credible candidates for this race on the Democratic side. Uh, in addition to Garza, Joe Jaworski, former mayor of Galveston, uh, a mediation attorney, Lee Merritt uh, out of the Dallas, North Texas area, civil rights lawyer, very well respected. Mike Fields uh, out of Houston, who was a Republican turned Democrat. Um, that race was interesting to me because again, Garza came out late and pretty much out of nowhere, spent about $2,000 on her race. Um, Jaworski, uh, in contrast, spent almost $700,000. And Garza um, had, had 40 plus percent of the vote. Um, now, is that going to make a difference uh, in two months? Will Jaworski, particularly with that famous last name, be able to um, uh, combat her seemingly popularity? Um, and, you know, again, this is important because this is the person that will face either Ken Paxton or George P. Bush. Well, then, Ray, yeah, Garza gets a big boost out of the fact that there's going to be a highly uh, hard fought primary runoff in the 28th district. Uh, there were about 50,000 votes cast in that one congressional district in the Democratic primary, one of the heaviest turnouts of the state. And those voters will, will likely come back and maybe even we may actually see an increase. And that's one of the most heavily Hispanic districts in the state. So Garza looks to be in a very strong position. Uh, you, she's got this very hotly contested runoff and some other local races around uh, the heavily Hispanic areas were not decided. So uh, in the fight to get people to come back to the polls, which is not gonna be easy on the Democratic side, I think she has some big structural advantages. Yeah, no, like, yeah, as Dick mentions, the 28th district and the 15th district had the runoffs. And she has the advantage that, you know, she had the advantage on this ballot. She was the only woman on the ballot and the only Latino. And so, you know, we saw that in the uh, land commissioner race on the Democratic side. Sandra Grace Martinez, who did not campaign, uh, still did very well because she had those things going for her. Uh, Garza will also, I think, get a real boost by, uh, so, so he has that advantage going on at the base level. People who are turned out in other races get to that spot on the ballot and see a Hispanic woman and go with that route over uh, an Anglo male. The other advantage she has, just, just by name, the other is I think she's going to get quite a bit of elite support because Democratic elites are going to be uncomfortable with having Beto work as their gubernatorial candidate, Mike Collier as their LG candidate, uh, go to attorney general, you know, Attorney General, the number three candidate. I don't think that many Democrats are. There are going to be a lot of Democrats that are uncomfortable with the idea of having three Anglo males as their top three candidates on the state list uh, and for the three most important positions. Uh, and then you probably might have, you already have Luke Warford down on railroad commissioner, and Jay Clayburg probably will take it for land commissioner. So I think there's going to be a lot of Democratic pressure saying, you know, uh, you know we're probably better off going with her uh, than with uh, Jaworski. I agree. Oh, we have a question. Speaking, from, oh, go ahead. One, one other point. Speaking of Canada, uh, Hispanic candidates, um, we will have a Hispanic candidate on both sides of the aisle for county judge uh, in Harris County. And I believe that's the first time in history. Dr. Murray can uh, correct me, but we have, of course, um, Lena Ildago on the Democratic side. Both candidates for the Republican nomination, Alexandra uh, Del Millar Miller. Alexander Mor Alexandra Del Moral Miller. Thank you, Mark. And you said it much prettier than me. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have either her or Vidal Mart Martinez. So uh, for the third largest county in the country, we will have a Hispanic at the head. Yeah. And, 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 now, now, I was about to say that the primaries in terms of uh, beyond looking at the individual candidates, I think they, they can tell us a few things about the parties. And since we're talking about the Latino, the Latinx vote, I think the Republicans are putting an effort down in the, 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 the border region in, in terms of looking at South Texas. And what does that mean for the, the Democrats in terms of being competitive? 
And I'm sure when we pivot to talk about the gubernatorial election, Governor Abbott, uh, he's going to suggest that his wife was the first Hispanic first lady in Texas. So I think a lot of things are going to come into the mix in terms of where the parties are, he are headed. Uh, I think o Aurora will have to do more in terms of trying to gen up uh, the black vote. For example, there are a lot of people out there who are still eligible to, to register to vote. And what impact will this have on the general election? So I'm going to uh, shift the record for a second. Uh, a question that, from the uh, audience. Um, there are going to be some competitive elections in the fall, particularly in the fast changing suburbs. So I think besides the Republicans trying to regain ground here in Harris County, uh, a lot of attention should be focused on Fort Bend County. Mm -hmm. The new Democratic County judge who was born in India, uh, Asian American uh, by background, uh, was renominated. Uh, and that's the most diverse county in the state, and it's politically very close. Uh, and so there should be some really hard fought races. Also, what's Collin County? I'm not, I'm rarely shocked by reading census numbers, but Collin County went from something like 9% Asian to 19% Asian in 10 years. It's on a track very similar to Fort Bend County. Biden got 48% of the vote. Joe, uh, Al Gore got 25% 20 years earlier. So that's the biggest suburban county in the state. And we'll have a number of competitive races in November for the legislature and other positions. But the, the Asian story is one at some point in the future we need to take up on the hobby hour because that's the fastest growing segment of the Texas population. And it's gr because Asian voters tend to be concentrated, highly concentrated. Uh, they can have a significant impact over the next decade, not only in Fort Bend County, but now in the North Dallas suburbs, which are the, about the fastest changing uh, demographic area in the state. A question from the audience. And, and so it's, it's a narrow question, but I want to get it, um, have it answered. Does Van Taylor's scandal place his congressional seat at risk for the Republicans? No. No. <laughs> No. It was made safe for November. <laughs> yeah. It may, be, it may yeah. be competitive by the end of the decade, yes. but not in 2022. So yeah. the withdrawal of the incumbent means that the number two finisher, I guess the former uh, county executive, yeah, Keith Self, Self, Keith Self. Uh, yeah. it is pretty much assured of going to Washington. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, and that's a real advantage for, for Republicans that they actually had him there because it, would, it could have been much more dangerous if you had had the random case where some random, some dude or some dudette signed up to file and were a complete lunatic uh, and then would just essentially get walk a cakewalk in. Right. Self, self is very conservative, but he was Collin County judge. He's a very respectable politician. He's not, he's not going to cause, well, one would have thought Dan Taylor, Van Taylor wouldn't have caused the party any embarrassment, but at least uh, you know, we know that uh, Self is unlikely to cause, you know, he's unlikely to be a Marjorie Taylor Greene or uh, other sort of uh, embarrassment. Yeah, and, he, and he's not going to support the minority leader for speaker. He's already on record, I think, saying that, right? <laughs> so just to, there's um, this discussion about the change in um, Hispanic Latino, Latino voting. Um, by my count, we have six potential Latina Congresswomen, right? I saw six, if they get through the general, you know, the midterm, is that correct? That would be quite yeah. significant. And also, if you look at the Southern counties, there's a, is this, is, is this just a minor shift or is this something pertaining to an earthquake with Latino voters in those areas for the Democratic Party shift, where they're shifting to the Republicans? Well, by context, George W. Bush got more votes in South Texas than Donald Trump in 2020. It's not like South Texas has always been this steady, reliable area that Democrats dominate. Yes, in most local, like you're talking about sheriff and county commissioner, but presidentially, uh, and even in some major statewide uh, races, South Texas is, uh, ha has a significant Republican vote. It used to be based on the fact there were a lot of Anglos left down there. Now the Anglos are largely gone, so now it's, the Republicans have made some inroads with Hispanics, but it's not as if this is earth shaking. This is, you could argue, just kind of, you know, regaining some ground that, uh, that people like John Tower and George W. Bush uh, had in previous elections. Well, and you see that in terms of public opinion down in, in the RGV and then over in Webb County, where 
uh, residents there who, who identify as Democrats still are much more conservative, much more centrist than Democrats elsewhere in the state. And you see that with their elected officials. That is, all of the more conservative uh, Democrats, the people at the moderate end of the spectrum, they all come from South Texas. And it, they're very, it's very difficult to get elected in South Texas as a progressive Democrat. You tend to get elected as a centrist Democrat. Jessica Cisneros is going to try to challenge that logic. But even there, she's not really challenging it. And that the only reason she's, if she does win the nomination, she'll win it with votes from Bear County and Guadalupe County, not from Webb, Star, and Zapata. Cuellar is going to clean up there. So it's really the valley has always been a conservative place. The, what, the difficulty for Democrats is the dissonance between the progressive Democrats at the national level and the more centrist Democratic positions at, in the valley and Webb County are, are more noteworthy now and on some higher profile issues. So there are many issues where valley Democrats are very similar to have very more progressive positions on things like support for Medicaid for all. Uh, support for education, or sort of more for social welfare programs. But then there are others where they tend to lean more towards Republicans, such as border security, Second Amendment rights, support for law enforcement. And so, you know, for like Jessica Cisneros, having her come down to support, I mean, having AOC come down to support Jessica Cisneros helps her with the vote up in Bear County and Guadalupe but hurts her elsewhere and will really come back to haunt her if she's the Democratic nominee in November because if the Republicans put their best candidate for Cassie Garcia, you can expect them to be replaying tape of Cisneros with AOC over and over and over again because Republicans will believe they have a chance to flip 28. If, uh, on the other hand, if the, if the Republicans nominate Sandra Witten, if she wins the primary, then forget it. Then you know, Cisneros would be there to defeat her. Michael, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, I'm good on that one. How about, how about you, Renee? No, I mean, just the same thing as uh, what Mark is saying, that that actually, uh, CD28 actually could flip a uh, Republican. I think that's the only seat that they probably could flip with these new lines. So earlier uh, on, you one thing so about the border, keep in mind that the, the largest uh, uh, Democratic county is El Paso, which marches to a totally different drop. And uh, Trump made very minimal inroads there compared to elsewhere. Uh, so that, that's a, you know, just putting everybody that's in a heavily Mexican-American area in one box. No, there are important regional differences. El Paso is very, very democratic uh, and much more progressive democratic than uh, the lower Rio Grande. And I, I think one thing to watch for is how is Beto going to affect these other, all these other races? Um, is he going to be able to garner the excitement and the turnout that he did in 2018? Um, because, you know, I think it's still a long shot for him to win, but he, his presence could certainly help some of these down ballot races. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, the science and political science documents is that for incumbents raising a ton of money often doesn't make a lot of difference but challengers and that's the, the the problem for Beto is we know Abbott's got a ton of money but hey he doesn't generate much excitement with spending another 10 million bucks uh but can Beto stay semi-competitive financially and that that's a huge question it, we just don't know but a dollar for the challenger is a hell of a lot more important than a dollar for the incumbent so if you're, you're sort of keeping score, watch particularly how much money Beto can raise. Can he get 20 or 25 or 30 million? Uh, possible. Maybe he can exceed that if he catches on nationally. Yeah. Texas has, uh, and to a lesser degree than perhaps with Ted Cruz, who is nationally reviled among Democrats and, and some independents. But Greg Abbott has moved up a little bit into the Ted Cruz country with his national profile, which might help Beto raise funds and of course running for governor you can take the big checks you know if you're a candidate for the senate or the congress you're significantly limited in the direct contributions to your campaign are about three thousand bucks but if you want to give a million bucks in texas that's fine if you're running for governor or lieutenant governor or any state office yeah and just to follow up to that i think we may be heading to uh one of the most expensive gubernatorial races in history, and people are predicting that it could go north of $200 million. Yeah. Right. 
There and, there's, there's just a ton of money out there nationally now that can flow. Look at how much money Jamie Harrison raised to run against uh, Lindsey Graham in South Carolina. What, $100 million in a small state. Texas is a big state and a hell of a lot more politically important for the future of American politics than South Carolina or even Florida. So, uh, yeah, this this could be a great year for the political consulting class. It'll be Mercedes and Porsches and uh, all uh, once they get out of the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it'll be a good year for the luxury cars or our political class. Well, especially the more Beto raises, the more Abbott will feel compelled to raise. And since Abbott can raise as much as he needs, there's there's really is no limit on how much he can raise, that we could get an arms race going where every time Beto raises a little more, if Abbott feels a little threatened, he'll go out and raise a little more. And that's, I think, as Michael said, that's how we get over 200 million. It's just where they just keep going back and forth and back and forth. And if Abbott feels remotely threatened, it's, you know, he gets, I mean, it's inefficient spending, as Dick mentions. It's, it's not really having much of an effect except at the very margins, but he'll still spend it. So yeah, and, uh, the impact on these big urban counties where no, the November results are, are very uncertain. Uh, you know, Dallas County and Travis County, not. Those counties are overwhelmingly right. Democratic. But in Harris County, uh, in, in uh, Tarrant County, in Bear County, we have a lot of competitive down-ballot races. So that governor's race, uh, which will, I think, drive up turnout, mm -hmm. uh, will have a lot of impact in the major urban and suburban areas that are not lopsidedly one party. Right. Now, I was going to say, going back to the Hispanic uh, vote, I, I think uh, that Abbott would try to take advantage and target Obeto, uh, Beto O'Rourke with uh, issues like climate change and talk about uh, what cost and what that means to the loss of jobs and whatever in terms of the, uh, the Ford uh, Shell uh, area down there. And certainly I think that that's gonna be one of the attack issues that he'll use. One thing, can we revisit the turnout question? I mean, for this, these primary elections did, was turnout lower than historically in terms of percent terms or was it about the same? No, about the same. About the same. The Republican okay. was slightly up. Uh, Democrats were exactly right where they in the wheelhouse where they've been since 1998 at about 5% of voting age population. Uh, you know, it's, it was, and, the, and even the Republican, it went to 9% from 8%. It's not exactly a massive shift. It, and as Dick mentioned, you had a lot of races. Dry. And that's, I think, you know, when we're talking about turnout, part of it's enthusiasm, and part of it, the Democrats just didn't have much to turn out for. Uh, you know, if you compare it to 2018, 2018, there were 10 arguably very competitive Democratic U.S. House primaries that really drove turnout. District 7 in, in Harris County is a great example of that. You had Lizzie Fletcher, Laura Moser, Alex Tantafillis, Jason Weston, high quality candidates with professional campaigns, spending over a million, driving people to turn out. This time around, Lizzie Fletcher's district, it was just Lizzie Fletcher. Uh, she probably didn't spend any time turning anybody out because didn't need to. We only had four, as you know, Dick mentioned these races already, 28 and 15 were, were competitive Democratic primaries. Uh, we had 35 in Austin, which really wasn't that competitive with Greg Kassar, but, and then we had 30 up in Dallas with Jasmine Crockett. That's four, four out of 38 instead of compared to 10 out of 36. And whereas we had a competitive gubernatorial primary on the Democratic side, not a big one, but Lupe Valdez, Andrew White generated a little bit of enthusiasm. Beto was going to be up against a bunch of people who spent, you know, less than $20,000 combined on their campaigns. I mean, I think other than a Facebook page, that's pretty much, that was the campaigning of most of Beto's uh, rivals. Yeah, so you don't want to make too little or too much out of the primary results. Because again, 3 million voters total, we probably will have 9 to 10 million in November. Uh, and you you have pretty decent turnout in a lot of rural counties because the Republican primary and occasionally the Democratic primary is the effective local election and that's all over. But in the urban counties, that's not the case. The real election is November. That's when you get an enormous turnout. One point I'd like to pivot to, uh, this was the first uh, statewide election uh, with a fair number of people voting with the new voter rules in effect, Senate Bill 1. And, you know, I, it's probably a good thing that only 3 million people were trying to vote because this, this system, particularly in Harris County, where they're a little ahead of the rest of the state in implementing this new voting system that creates a paper trail for every ballot. That's a, that's a real slowdown in voting. 
Uh, and Harris County didn't exactly uh, acquit itself very well on election day or election reporting, uh, getting the votes counted and so forth. So uh, probably a good idea to have a dry run election with 3 million voting it, to get ready for the nine or 10 million that are gonna be voting in November. My advice is uh, vote in person early <laughs> in the fall. Uh, these mail ballots have too damn many potential glitches and uh, uh, it, it's a little easier to vote in November because almost everybody's voting a party vote. They're not reading the names of the candidates. They just go down and are doing vote Republican, 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 Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. But it, it's still going to be awfully slow in our county where I think we can expect about 1.3 to 1.4 million people voting, not 320,000, which is what we had in this election. So Dick, do you think that will become an issue in the, uh, the county judges race? For sure, for sure. Republicans are gonna pound away that Democrats have mismanaged the county and you pay the price at the polls. Uh, and you know, that's, yeah. that's uh, they've got something to work with. We've had a new administrator come in in Harris County with not much experience in running elections. And I think uh, we're seeing some of the results of that. Pretty much in 2020, you had a different direction there uh, and the county was very aggressive and, and uh, but generally the election went all pretty smoothly. Uh, we're not sure of that in 2022. Right, and so it's no longer an elected official. Uh... The only people you can hold responsible are the three people who chose the administrator, right. Lena Hidalgo, Rodney Ellis, and Adrian Garcia against both Republican opposition, but also quite a bit of Democratic opposition uh, to how they went about it. You know, and it, the thing is, in theory, in an, in an election administrator who's appointed, it's not a bad thing, as there are a lot of advantages to have it from professionalism, uh, from professionalization, et cetera. But when you do it, you need to do it right. And many counties do it right. Fort Bend County, we haven't heard anything because they did it right. Uh, clearly, what, however they have done it in Harris County uh, has not worked out well. And as, as many people criticize, they, since you can't hold the election administrator responsible or accountable because they're appointed, you need to hold the people who appointed them accountable. Right. Yeah, and that'll come back most evidently in the county judge race. Adrian Garcia's district is pretty heavily Democratic. Mm -hmm. and they have really Hispanic, so, but in the county at large, uh, election administration will be a big issue, I think, in November. Yeah. Could, even be an issue, could it even be an issue in the, uh, the, uh, the Houston 2023 mayoral race if yeah. the person who purchased those machines tries to run on their track record of elections administration <laughs> versus uh, a person who has 50 years of uh, a record in the Texas legislature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good segue. I wanted to talk about Senate District uh, 15. What does that portend uh, since he was accused by uh, Molly Cook, the opponent, in terms of running for two races, running for the Senate and also uh, for mayor? Uh, any thoughts on that? He got 57% of the vote. Uh, so what, what, what are I, the ways? Uh, I thought the Cook race was a very smart race because uh, you have her opponent basically saying, I'm running for mayor, but in the meantime, I'm also running for my longtime seat in the state Senate. Yes. Uh, but that means if he's successful in his mayor's race, the new 15th district, which was just redrawn and only two people have run in a competitive race there, and one of them is Molly Cook. Oh, yeah. She'll have a huge advantage if, if Whitmire has to give up his seat to be sworn in as mayor in January 1, I guess, 2024. Uh, uh, so that, that get, sometimes getting 42 or 43 percent is a big, big deal. Yeah. And I think uh, this new progressive candidate uh, did extraordinarily well against the dean of the Senate, who had a gazillion dollars, 12 million, I think, in his account. But uh, she uh, comes out of this as a serious political player, I think, in, in our county. I agree. And the district is very democratic now. There's no it was redrawn and there's no meaningful Republican opportunity in the 15th district. So let's shift to um, federal, federal issues. So President Biden's first year in office has recently concluded. Um, would you, typically in the first year, there's a honeymoon phase for this first six months, and then we start to see a decline because of a variety of issues. Yeah. Um, in this case, uh, it looks like the Afghanistan withdrawal was the 
precipitous event that led to this. Would you agree with that? And then what's happened since that has driven the poll numbers down further? COVID. Hmm. Yeah. COVID, COVID coming back. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would start with, uh, of course, Afghanistan. Uh, he was able to get the infrastructure bill passed, but build back better. I think the messages uh, just haven't been there. What does it mean? A lot of people don't know what's in it. And then uh, opposition from two stalwarts in the U.S. Senate, and that's Manchin and Cinema. Um, what? How does that play? And certainly, uh, voting rights in terms of passing uh, uh, those two bills. Uh, that doesn't look like it's going to happen. And how do you gen up a base that's going to be important for the upcoming general election in Texas for the Democrats? And how does it play nationwide? So those would be some concerns that, that I would have. And then how do you contain, when you're dealing with Manchin and Cinema, a left of your party where you have these, what I... I I describe as food fights within the department, but within your party by AOC and others, and you may get some additional members in the fall. So uh, that's gonna be interesting. And, and I think that uh, certainly Abbott will use Biden as one of the targets to campaign against O'Rourke in terms of whether they woke and all of these other things we see. And externally, you, just looking forward now to the midterms, besides the crisis in the Ukraine, and there's many other issues going on, there's a specter of inflation. And the last time we saw something like this was late 70s, early 80s. Ronald Reagan supported what Paul Volcker was doing, and that's about to happen now, which was to raise interest rates and start a, a restrictive monetary policy to tamp down inflation expectations. It took three years to do it. So and, and in 1982, the Republicans got their heads handed to them. They lost 26 seats. Now, in comparison, 1994 and some other more recent midterms, it's not so bad. But Reagan, for, for, the, for all practical purposes, lost his working majority in the House. He had worked with the bull weevils back then. Do you see the same thing happening to Biden now? Because it looks like the Fed's about this month. I mean, Ukraine may slow this process of raising interest rates down, but it's going to happen. The question is, um, how is that going to affect Biden or will the, will the public not put the responsibility on him, but just in general to blame both parties? Well, uh, as Dr. Sabato's weekly reports keep pointing out, uh, of the last 40 midterm elections, the, the entire history of them in our country in non-presidential years, uh, the party holding the White House has lost ground in 37. So that's a pretty powerful uh, trend. It may be less than a little bit in 2022 because Republicans did not get as much gain as they had hoped for out of gerrymandering around the country. Democrats did some extreme gerrymanders in a couple of states and Republicans sort of cashed in to protect incumbents in places like Texas. Uh, you also have a, a much more polarized electorate now. So you probably, it's pretty hard to see either major party not getting at least 45 or 46 or 47 percent of the vote because they have so many locked in partisans. Uh, but sure, I think the Democrats are, you know, at great risk of taking a thumping, but not anything like 1994 was a net loss of 63 seats. That's that's impossible. There are just way, way too many safe seats now. But 15 or 20, that still gives Republicans, a, you know, a workable House majority. Uh, they could end up getting a majority like Nancy Pelosi, and that that would be a nightmare for the Republican Speaker because. The Democrats, at the end of the day, do fall in line with Pelosi. Republicans will not. Maybe if there's a second coming of the savior, you could get a, a unified party behind a speaker. But that seems unlikely in, uh, from reading my uh, biblical text. So, uh, so, yeah, Republicans are certainly probably 90 percent likely to get a majority. But a lot will depend on the size of that majority. And if it's close, Keep the speaker in your prayers. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll need all the help they can get. Yeah, I, I think from the Biden administration's perspective, I mean, they haven't been too successful now. While the Republicans mm -hmm. will likely have a difficult majority with the gender control and among that the speaker will exercise, they will be able to block anything. 
That is, they may not be able to push much through uh, because, of, because of internal problems, but if the Bi Biden's hopes of passing any meaningful progressive legislation will be overcome January of 2023. Mm -hmm. There's just, there won't be, the House will be lost for almost for sure, uh, barring some re remarkable recovery between now and November. And the Senate quite possibly will be lost, not in terms of passing things, filibuster still surviving, but in terms of agenda control once again. That is, Biden, sim Biden simply won't be able to get anything through. And that's, I think, with the Senate, where you start to run into issues is with uh, potential Supreme Court nominations. If anything happens to a sitting Supreme Court justice after January of 2023, McConnell's ability to essentially slow walk it until the end of, you know, the end of the Biden administration is quite possible. Yeah. Ray, you have anything to add in this? Well, I guess a couple of things, uh, you know, media has been focusing on Biden's um, dropping approval rating. It's still higher than um, President Trump's rating was at this point, um, day 408. Um, and, you know, we don't even have to go, well, I guess 40 years ago doesn't seem that long ago in one sense, but go back to Ronald Reagan, his um, approval rating on the same, at the same time was 46%. He obviously was able to overcome. Uh, we've also seen people in the opposite direction. Um, uh, George H.W. Bush had an approval rating of 72% at the same point in his tenure. So um, I, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in approval ratings at this point. Um, Biden and the Democratic Party overall really needs to concentrate on their messaging because uh, the Biden administration has a long list of economic successes um, outside of inflation, obviously, but, you know, more jobs than any one period in the history of this country, 6.4 million jobs. 5.7% um, growth in the economy. Um, you know, there, the start, stock market is, is up. Um, there's fewer bankruptcies in, 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 within the same uh, period of time. And all of these gains during, we're still in a pandemic. Um, but I don't think people understand that, you know, and even though, Unemployment's down and wages are up. They are so missing the boat on the messaging. And I think that's a critical piece going into the general election. And I, I agree with you, Renee. Uh, and I think that was a start uh, with the State of the Union when he talked about not defunding the police. And certainly on yesterday, I think he was in Wisconsin. He'll be in North Texas later, later in the week. He has to have a James Carville moment. It's the economy stupid. And he has to talk about how he's going to address inflation, these things. And that's the only way that I can see it. And also, I would add that I think he has to give the impression that he's in charge. And so um, you have politics as retail. So you have to get out and you have to, to work it. And I, I think, unfortunately, for Biden is Reagan did make that comeback, but he had James Baker running his campaign back in 1984. And there is no James Baker anymore on the Democratic side or the Republican side. So it's a tough time. And, and of course, Reagan did have that advantage of being very charismatic and a great speaker. You know, even though uh, President Biden, I think, did a good job with the State of the Union, he's not known for being eloquent. Um, so that is something that the party as a whole is are going to have to address or overcome. I know, especially because we feel for the Iranian people so much. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Mark. <laughs> You're going to close on that note, right? <laughs> yeah. That was a gap. <laughs> I think uh, we're, in my experience with the modern presidency, both parties have more uncertainties about their presidential prospects in 2024 than at any point. Uh, Trump continues to be an absolute off the charts front runner on the Republican side, uh, but would face a very difficult general election if he's nominated unless the Democrats, which they are potentially capable of doing, really shooting themselves in the foot. You know, Biden is 
by far now the oldest president to ever serve and will be 82 going into the next election round. You don't have a particularly popular vice president waiting in the wings. Uh, so just an enormous uncertainty about the presidential uh, field because it's not normal times. And, you know, it looks like we're probably stabilizing on the COVID front. But, you know, we have now this new extraordinary situation in Europe that virtually nobody other than the intelligence agencies of the United States saw coming uh, until a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And, you know, that's generally these kind of uh, destabilizing factors in the near term benefit a president. Right. But, that's a question. you know, his election, if he runs or is the nominee, that's three years away, two and a half years away. Right. So that's a hell of a long time. Last question um, before we have to end this great discussion. You have people like William Galston have been working, you know, they're, they're um, strategists for the Democratic Party. And he wrote something the other day with, I think it was Lane Carmack, both do these, this kind of thing about vision statements and things of that sort. They point to the cultural differences too. And I'm wondering, I mean, you hear about this thing about the coastal elites. And, and also their priorities are not the priorities of the of bread and butter folks. And you've got to wonder if that's also playing into the disconnect between the Democratic Party and the populace, more so than the Republicans right now. What do you think I, of that? I think it opens a lot of doors for Republicans because the, it's, they're a lot, it's, a lot, it's very easy for short sound bites that I'm opposed to CRT or I'm opposed to wokeness without having to define what it is, where the Democrats get in trouble is that then they have to define why that attack doesn't make any sense or why it's a red herring. But, you know, that were quite, whereas, whereas uh, the attack can be made in about five to 10 seconds, uh, the rebuttal takes about 30 seconds to a minute. And so it's, it's that isn't a disadvantage that Democrats face. And, and that's, you know, there's a reason why you see a lot of Republican office holders using those issues because they've tested them and they find they work well. They aren't, they aren't using them because they believe they aren't going to work. They're using them because precisely they believe they will work. Yeah. They're very effective in the primaries. Yeah. Some more dangerous in the general elections yeah. because we continue to see these demographic changes where the older white population is declining uh, more slowly in the upper Midwest, which uh, it remains, I think, the critical pre presidential battleground. Uh, but the Republicans have this dangerous flank down south known as Texas. We added 4 million people between 2010 and 2020, and they were very different than the 25 million people who lived here before. Because, and we're about to add another 4 million over, the, we've already added over a million since the last census. So uh, we're, we're a state where some of these cultural things don't necessarily play as well as they do in, say, Wisconsin or Michigan, places like Fort Bend County and Collin County that have a huge number of non-white voters now. Yeah. I, I would simply add that I think the Democrats, they could gain uh, some traction uh, beyond the economic piece or the cost of living if they really talked about uh, impoverished people in terms of how much we're losing in terms of without having Medicaid expansion in the state of Texas. So I'm, I'm thinking that uh, Beto and also the Democratic Party will try to play into that. And also looking at what happened with the electric grid, if you're poor, if you're at the bottom of the economic totem pole, then you suffered. So the message has to address these kinds of issues. Renee, you have the last word. Thank you for having us, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Great sign off. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Um, Thank you. Our next hobby hour will feature a conversation with presidential historian, Dr. Luke Nichter, who will talk about one of the most tumultuous and violent years in American history, 1968. I think all of us, except for Renee and Mark, remember this. That's three out of five. Of <laughs> um, it ended with the election of Richard Nixon. <laughs> the conversation hosted by Ambassador Chase Untermeyer, professor of practice at the Hobby School, will be on April 13th at noon. You will be getting more information about this as the event approaches. I want to thank our great panel, um, and we'll see you in the fall. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.